At COP, we have the opportunity to finally get an agreement on Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, addressing carbon markets and ensuring that the targets set six years ago are achieved. For the first time that different countries uh, on the earth have a common objective because we want to re restore the balance of the environment. Uh, we want to stop the global warming and we are now aiming at the same directions. The main opportunity in COP26 that uh, this is the last chance for us to commit to below 1.5 degrees. We have seen how the global crisis can affect the global economy and world leaders have to act now for the uh, mitigating and adaptation to climate change because we wouldn't be able maybe to control any uh, unforeseen climate crisis in the future. Uh, unlike we did with the uh, COVID uh, crisis. The first opportunity is that there is a global awareness created because of this, you know, observed climate extremes. The second one is that there is improved scientific evidence with high level of confidence that can provide strong foundation for decision making. The third one is that there is this technological solutions, the advancement in technological solutions, getting more affordable and more accessible. It's a big opportunity to address every other crisis because they are all interconnected. If we talk about justice, social justice, food production, the loss of biodiversity, all crises are connected. So our big opportunity is to rethink everything. I think the main barriers to change is ultimately this silo-driven mentality where you've got civil society state, academia, and the private corporation all saying very different things. Ultimately, we need to bring these four spheres of influence together to shape positive change. And I believe that we are all getting to a mindset where the time to act is now. And what better way than seeing civil society, state, corporation, and academia pulling together to make a difference. The Net Zero Transition Pathway touches upon all parts of the economy. So we're all collectively responsible, from the producers, to the exporters, to the consumers. But things are just not moving fast enough. The current carbon budget left for the world is shrinking year on year. We not only need to invest in nature-based solutions, for example, but we also need to ensure that countries and sectors abide by their commitments in a consistent and transparent way. Mandatory disclosure and reporting aligned to global standards should be introduced without delay. One of the most common barriers is the limited knowledge of mid-level management of climate risk-related issues, their consequences on business and even on their personal lives. Um, another common barrier, but uh, also an opportunity, is the lack of access of funding and capex expenditure for increasing energy efficiency in operations. The main barrier is, the, I think, the lack of commitment at different levels, uh, especially uh, by, you know, like developed countries, because they have commitments towards developing countries. There are more promises and, you know, very ambition, ambitious of promises, but there is less action. On the other hand, uh, developing countries have more strategies and, and action plans, but less implementation. We need to translate these promises into into actions and, and, and strategies into uh, investment plans and, and actions on the ground. Those most affected by the crisis are now not being heard. And those looking to make a change do not have incentives. I would summarize uh, three Ps. Number one, uh, polarization of development. Number two, politicalization of the relationship or country to country relationship in terms of our differences as uh, as a humankind and number three procrastination in our uh, discussion and actions uh, in terms of the climate i'm expecting from the leaders to keep the momentum of pledging commitment and mobilizing finance and also utilizing COP27, which most probably will take place in Egypt, in Africa, to concentrate more on the global south and that climate action in the global south. So both COP26 and COP27, I'm expecting a lot from leaders to commit more to climate action, mitigation and adaptation. I want to see more integration of the scientific approaches to decision-making. 
And I would really like to see realistic targets associated with dates that are not 2050 or 2030. We do need to look to be looking at short term and measure impact and progress in the short term. We are living in an increasingly dense world and spatial sustainability needs to be a counterpoint to social sustainability. We need to think about cultural preservation and the ability to preserve who we are and understand where we are going. And finally, let's use technology wisely to ensure that it enhances our lives and also can actually help reduce our overall consumption and thus lead to a greener future for future generations. This journey has to be as inclusive as possible and create new jobs, sectors, and provide opportunity for enhanced prosperity. The most significant contribution that we can make to tackling climate change is financing the transition to net zero. Financing is key to building a sustainable future, and one of the most important aspects is to ensure that it flows to all parts of the world. The recent wave of net zero emissions pledges from many countries is most promising, and this momentum needs to increase. But ensuring that pledges are translated into immediate actions, long-term strategies, and of course, effectively implemented is the type of leadership we need now. We need leaders who believe in the science behind climate change. We need leaders at every level, young and seasoned, who bring their passion and action into the communities who most need support. This isn't a question of racing against the clock. We need to stop and restart with a sustainable mindset.